Hello and welcome back to Looking Forward, a weekly podcast of debate and discussion about politics and ideas brought to you by the Institute of Public Affairs. This may be the week we look back on as the week where the global wave of hysteria requiring lockdowns for coronavirus may perhaps have peaked and recede as sensible voices start to come to the fore. We'll be talking about the Great Barrington Declaration and the very, very serious academics who are getting around that. We'll be talking about what's happening in Victoria as there seems to be not only uh, bodies strewn around uh, all over the place, but also finally some admissions that the incredibly ridiculous targets for Uh, getting out of lockdown are simply that and unachievable and that maybe it's time for a different approach. And we'll be talking about the IPA's ideas for a different approach as well. Uh, With me as always is my co-host from RMIT University, Dr Chris Berg. G'day Scott. Welcome Chris. And uh, a very special guest today, uh, entrepreneur, public policy expert, published author and most recently a uh, co-author of a paper commissioned by the Institute of Public Affairs on uh, an alternative approach to managing coronavirus, none other than Asher Judah. G'day. Thanks for having me. Oh, great to have you, Asher. And uh, yeah, welcome to the uh, the podcast. And um, uh, Chris, would you like to just set us up? Yeah, sure, Scott. So I'll set us up. So I think the big thing, I, I think what we will reflect about this week um, uh, at least outside Victoria, where, of course, Scott and Asher, we are only obsessed about what's happening in Victoria because we are living through this in the most obscene way possible. But I think what we will reflect on this week or what historians will reflect on this week is the um, the significance of the Great Barrington Declaration. Now, the Great Barrington Declaration is a, um, a joint statement, a petition, released by um, a number of really top epidemiologists from Stanford, Oxford, and Harvard, arguing for an alternative model to dealing with the coronavirus crisis. So I'm gonna quote Scott for a second, if you don't mind. Um, They write that current lockdown policies are producing devastating effects on short and long-term public health. The most compassionate approach that balances the risks and benefits of reaching herd immunity is to allow those who are at minimal risk of death death to live their lives normally, to build up immunity to the virus through natural infection, while better protecting those who are at higher risk. We call this focused protection. Now, of course, this is not the first we have heard of um, uh, herd immunity strategy. It's not the first we have heard of lockdown skepticism by any means. Um, But it is a really significant statement because it comes from some of those top epidemiologists. This is not Um, This is not us saying it. This is not economists saying it. This is not social scientists saying it. This is epidemiologists whose specialty is in the science of managing pandemics. Asha, I'll ask you first, actually, just to step back. What do you think the significance of this statement is, if you don't mind? Thanks, Chris. I think it's it's a considerable breaking of ranks amongst the the experts on coronavirus and its consequences globally. Uh, For a long time, I guess that group has spoken with one voice and done their best to keep everybody speaking in one voice. But as more evidence has emerged, as we realise the virus is less fatal than we thought, as our treatments have become more effective, uh, the lockdown measures that perhaps were justified at the very beginning can no longer be justified. Um, I think for months there's been an internal debate behind the scenes uh, and because one side has had the view we have to stick to our position no matter what, um, the dam has burst and people have had enough. They can see the damage lockdowns are causing. And I think we're going to look back at this as a turning point, uh, a dam bursting point, and now we're going to see lockdowns being wound down across the globe because the coronavirus, COVID-19, is not going anywhere. Um, we need to learn how to live with it. And even the experts now are saying it's time it's time to relax things and get on with life. Yeah, I think that's right, Asha. Um, we've talked about some of these experts uh, on this on this program. Uh, made the point repeatedly that we're told to believe the science, believe the experts. Uh, but when you know we quote uh, Sunitra Gupta uh, from Oxford, or I referred on this show, I think I made it a staff pick actually. A tremendous interview that uh, former Deputy PM John Anderson did with. Uh, Jay Bhattacharya uh, uh, from Harvard, who's a, um, a medico and a health economist, uh, 
Um, terrific interview with lots of relevance to Australia. But this was all greeted with uh, deafening silence. It's like the um, the Germans, of course, have a word for everything, and I think they call it uh, Totzgeweizkeit, which is death by silence, like when there's criticism that's trying to break this wall of uh, so-called consensus and you're trying to maintain the illusion of consensus, you just don't talk about it. And so the significance of the declaration, I guess, is so you had uh, Sinitra Gupta, Martin Kaldorf, Jay Bhattacharya all saying these things, but the optics of them coming together in a room um, and then launching this petition with you know another couple of dozen serious players signing on is that it was no longer possible to ignore and uh, that's really will, the breakthrough. I, I will do a um, self-declaration that that room was at the American Institute for Economic Research, who's published two of my books this year, including one on one on um, uh, how to get the economy out of the COVID crisis. But uh, it's, it's also important that, again, this week, like literally this week, um, we've had statements from the World Health Organization sort of just stepping back or urging governments to step back from lockdown. So... I saw this the other day on, um, I think it was news.com.au, who um, released, and I was a, I was a tad skeptical. I was like, eh, you know, could be could be could be a thing. But this is this is a really explicit statement from one of the COVID envoys of the World Health Organization. And again, Scott, do you mind if I quote this? Please do, because it's super important. We in the World Health Organization. So, sorry, who's who, in, who's this talking, Chris? Sorry, my apologies. It's uh, Dr. David Nabarro. He's the special envoy on COVID-19. And he's talking um, to Andrew Neal from The Spectator, the editor of The Spectator, on a video that you can watch on the internet. Um, in, in fact, it's a little short, but you can watch. He says, Dr. David Nabarro says, we in the World Health Organization do not advocate lockdowns as the primary means of control of this virus. The only time we believe a lockdown is justified is to buy you time to reorganize, regroup, rebalance your resources, protect your health workers who are exhausted. We really do appeal to all world leaders, stop using lockdown as your primary method of control. Now, before we get too excited, so he's not against lockdowns per se. It's not the World Health Organization backing away from the idea that you should lock down, but it is rejecting really explicitly the model that we've adopted certainly in Melbourne, but the model that so many governments seem to have adopted, which is no longer just the flattening the curve so that we can get the hospital system up to scratch, but you're locked down until the virus disappears. That is a explicit rejection. And it's explicit rejection for the obvious reasons that it's just not sustainable, as we're learning this week in Melbourne. But it's just it, it's just not possible to eliminate a virus that is this infectious. And it was never going to be, was it, Ash? No, that's, that's absolutely right. Look, I mean, at the beginning, we didn't know what we were dealing with. We were looking at horrific death rates out of Italy and France, and we thought this was Spanish flu-esque. But as time's gone on and as science has begun to understand it better, we've realised that this is nowhere near as bad. It is manageable. Uh, the, the, the population that's highly vulnerable is elderly or with preconditions, which is a smaller part of the population than we imagined. Um, this virus is something we have to learn to live with. And it's especially important today because there is no vaccine and global transmission rates are rising. And as long as those two things remain the case, there's no elimination strategy that will work. We've seen that in New Zealand. We've seen that in New South Wales and Victoria. The numbers will bubble around at a low level and they're a manageable level. If you have a modern healthcare system with good contract tracing, good technology, good ICU and um, good management. Um, I think the one other point I'd just like to add, Chris, if I can, about what yeah. Scott was saying is we've always supported a good governments, um, good institutions, people who prefer public and vigorous public debate, uh, to have a good discussion of science. Science is never supposed to be about a consensus. It's a comp competition of views. And on this, we're finally seeing the other side of the argument emerge that there isn't simply one way to deal with the crisis. There isn't simply one way to deal with this virus. There are other ways and lockdowns are no longer in vogue. Um, and just like the climate change debate where there was a suppression of one side of the debate, eventually uh, alternative views emerged and that's a healthier place for society to be because then the public can weigh up their choices better.
And I think what can, really... can I just, for instance, do you mean like in the climate debate over this book called Climate Change the Facts 2020? Is that, is that what you had in mind there, Asha? Published oh, that, by the that, IPA? Yes. Yes, I forgot. Uh, shameless plug too. Yes, absolutely. Yes. First shameless uh, plug not, for the IPA. Where are Chris's books? Where are Chris's books? I want <laughs> they're, to see They're that. just over here. I'll, I'll, I'll pop them up. Um, <laughs> they're always within arm's reach, Asha. Oh, excellent. About that. Um, uh, Where is, and we'll <laughs> get to your books as well, Asha. <laughs> Uh, no, but it's 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 actually a really important point because I think what we have, for um, a, a variety of reasons, um, we've got a public understanding now of the concept of science as a consensus-driven um, uh, activity. Now, um, I don't uh, you know I I don't think that's justified in the climate science space, but to the extent that it ever was, we've taken that assumption that science agrees on stuff and it has consensus on this and then we've just quickly imported that into a really i mean it's not just a frontier area of scientific research it's a completely novel coronavirus now we, we've known about coronaviruses um in the past of course but we haven't known how to manage a pandemic on this scale using not just our contemporary technology our contemporary models of globalization but even just our contemporary attitudes to risk, which we've talked about on the podcast. We, but instead, we just we just took the consensus model and we just popped it on top of a completely new problem, a new crisis, and we did so in the space of really weeks, early in February, yeah. March. And I've, I've, um, I've listened to the entire two hours of the discussion with those three luminaries that I mentioned, um, uh, greatly assisted actually by uh, getting a couple of journalists to manage uh, the asking of the questions um, and really got to the nub of it. And what you saw is not three uh, experts saying we're right and those other guys are wrong. It was actually three people who not only have alternative views but were making exactly the points you were making, Chris, that, you know, the other guys, it's not that they're, right, they're wrong and we're right, it's that, that this is actually not the correct idea of how science should proceed and how science should inform public policy. And, um, and, of course, there's no single source of expertise. Um, and, and certainly, uh, I think, Asher, you make reference to the low-level bureaucrats that are supposedly responsible for a lot of this policy in Australia, not, ev not even actually the experts. Um, and they do also make the point, I think it was Jay Bhattacharya, that, well, yes, and so you collect all that scientific knowledge, uh, you consult the experts. Maybe you have an organisation like the Centre for Disease Control in the US, which is then responsible for collating it all and maybe synthesising it. But politicians are still ultimately the ones who make decisions because only elected representatives can and should be the ones who weigh up these conflicting objectives. But we've been sold the lie by those politicians trying to avoid politician, uh, trying to avoid that accountability, that they're relying on health advice. Because it's also really it's it's really unclear what field of science we should be consulting in this. Mm -hmm. So it's not solely an epidemiological question. It's not solely a medical question. Are you, would you go first to the virologists and find out their views? Would you go first to the economists and find out their views? Im we're in a, immunologists, we're in, we're, epidemiologists, public the, health, the, yeah, the they, criminologists. Yeah. Given that we're taking this curfew model, it's 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 very unclear. And and I think we've wildly underestimated how experimental. The public policy approach has been, um, uh, and and I fear, I suspect that we are going to view 2020 as a catastrophic year from a public policy perspective. That we made a enormous amount of decisions without fully interrogating them. I, I, we, as in you know, global societies. Now, I'm not. Now, in one sense, you can't be excessively judgmental because, again. This is choice under incredible uncertainty, certainly in the first period. But given that incredible uncertainty, the inability of governments to accept that they were making experimental decisions, that they were making those highly risky, highly uncertain decisions and public policy choices, that's, that's what's been most obscene about this. And the idea that we haven't been able to or it has been illegitimate to debate these sorts of things or even investigate them because the science has a consensus over lockdowns has been obscene. And this week it just really sees, maybe this is the feeling I'm having, but it really seems like that is falling away. 
I, I think that's right, Chris. I, I think in certainly the Victorian perspective, the Department of uh, Health and Human Services, catastrophic fail. Um, and, I, and I'll come to why I think that is in a second, but I also think the, the media journalism has also failed us during this lockdown. Uh, we've seen evidence in the last week what happens when you know, Peter Credlin turns up at a press conference with the Premier, gets to the nub of the issue with one line of questioning, and uh, the head of the Department of Premier and Cabinet's blown to pieces. Uh, what have the journalists been doing? Are they really hungry to expose what's happened in Victoria, the scandal, or are they just simply managing the relationship with the government as a top priority so they can get access to the next story. Um, journalism used to be more courageous and more questioning. I think that's led us down across the board. But in terms of the Department of Health in Victoria, those who have been following politics and public policy a long time will know that in the 80s and the 90s, you know, we had a financial crisis in Victoria. The Kennett government came to power and completely restructured the Department of Health and introduced something called case mix funding which was seen to be the best funding model to handle the growing health budget around Australia. Subsequently, became su subsequently adopted all over Australia, indeed. That's yes. right. Um, we were the standout. We built a big ego around it too because everyone was copying our ideas. But what's happened during this crisis is Victoria has been exposed as being the basket case on health policy in the country. The Department of Health has had oodles of money, no excuses. Uh, the Premier was a former health minister. Uh, the Labor Party has been in government for 20 of the last 24 years. And um, what's happened, we've, they've failed on their ultimate mission, was to, which was to keep us safe, to manage crisis in the health space. And uh, now we need a clean out. So I think that certainly will echo for, for a generation in terms of public policy and certainly health public policy in Australia. And all the other states will now be looking at Victoria, not as the example to follow, but the example to avoid, to find out what went wrong and to make sure it doesn't happen there. Yeah, well, one can, I, can I just step back on the, the before we we um and you've raised a lot of interesting issues there, Asha, that I'd like to discuss. But just on the journalism thing, because I think there's a global story here as well that's not specific to Victoria. We're going through, and we've discussed this a lot on the podcast. We're going through really um, complex ructions in how the media um, operates, the economics of the media, but also how the media sees itself. And it's very much seen itself as its role is not to just report, you know, they will dismiss reporting the news as stenography. You go to a press conference and you write down what the, what the, um, uh, what the politician said or whatever, or the stakeholder said. They've seen their job instead to sort of teach us about stuff. So that's where we get all this fact checking. This is why we get all these explainers. This is why they they think their job is to is to make the judgment calls. Right now, I think this has had some really perverse effects. Um, uh, it's given us this scientific consensus idea because journalists need a scientific consensus, but it's also given us a press corps globally that is very that that doesn't have much skepticism when they're presented with something that is presented as the consensus we saw this most famously on the mask issue way back at the start of the crisis when a lot of these explainery type journalists would tell us that oh in fact masks don't work because they were being told that by health departments and they were being told that by health departments because the health departments didn't want everybody to go out and buy the masks because otherwise the medicos wouldn't happen. And, you know, the, I, I think that was a really terrible decision, but that was the decision that we made. But it was presented to us like the truth, the facts. These have been delivered. And for the last six months, we've been listening to the same thing about lockdowns. We've been listening to the same instructions from these, quote, explainer-type um, journalists that, that have just been parroting what they're told by the Victorian Health Department or the CDC or, or whoever it is that they, for some reason, trust because they're figures of authority. This has been a constant stream throughout this crisis, and it's done us extremely poorly as citizens who are trying to come to terms with what on earth is going on and what those public policy decisions are being based on. I guess it continues that that multi-decade destruction of public trust in, in everything. It was the unions are corrupt, uh, the churches and religious bodies have got some answer, questions to answer, politicians are corrupt and uh, can't be trusted, can't be believed. Now journalists we can't trust. 
if there's no one left to trust, well, who, well what do you believe? Well, thank God this, for the These IPA. are the structures of society. No, podcast, th- hosts. Yeah. podcast hosts. Yeah. Podcast hosts. No, I think that's, IPA. No, I think that's right, Asher. Although I will, as I... Blockchain uh, academic. As, as, well, as, as I sometimes do on this <laughs> podcast, I, I will uh, defend, I guess... Uh, well, certainly the idea of journalism and the idea of a free press um, that we're desperately trying to cling on to because two things have happened which have influenced this. As we've discussed, um, you know, media, the collapse of the business model has driven them into an idea of just servicing a community. And so if you're like in the, in the Fairfax press, um, uh, you are servicing a community which was very pro-lockdown, um, that, that's probably the... You know, it's like the, this is lined up with the culture wars as we're now seeing. And, you know, as the polls shifted, it's not quite as polarised as America, but, um, uh, you know, the age was servicing a market which was very pro-lockdown very, and already carries this idea of listen to the experts and, and you know, a sort of communitarian enforcement, a sort of a new puritanism of anyone who's not wearing a mask 24-7 is obviously a social, social outcast or should be. And, and we've talked about the social media pressure. So everyone listening to the podcast should understand that it is actually a brave journalist who goes against that. So they're both going against the business model of their employer. And I've seen this on social media, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure, Asher, you have as well, that a journalist who expresses any scepticism at all, uh, like straight away on the Twitter feed, it's like, oh, you know, just Murdoch stooge, Murdoch stooge. And then lynching, a lynching. And then I've seen this someone like Chip Legrand uh, at the Age, who I've quoted extensively because I think he twigged to what Eccles was up to a, months ago. Um, uh, so someone would quote his article on Twitter, and they'd go Murdoch Stooge, and then someone would say, "Well, no, actually, this is the Age." And then they go, "Oh yeah, but he used to work for Murdoch." You know, the, the the social pressure that journalists have been under in Melbourne is intense. There have been stories not written essentially out of fear of what the repercussions would be of losing access to the Victorian government, of being hounded by their peers, um, you know, in a, in a world where journalists are being hounded out of their jobs by Twitter mobs uh, yeah. for, for stepping outside of the, ba- the very, very na- narrow boundaries of what's acceptable. That's, that's some of what's been operating. And that's, again, to come back to the theme of the show, that's why it's so important that the, the wall's finally cracking um, because we need those journalists to feel that, well, okay, maybe maybe this is a, a chance for us to, to break free. So should we talk about Victoria? Should we do that now, Scott? Yeah, go for should it. We? Go for it. Yeah, all right. Okay. I want to make a point, a really simple point that I'm going to take as long as possible to make. Um, <laughs> we went... <laughs> We've talked about this, Chris. We have talked about this, but, you know, it's my Only I had a new book to read. <laughs> exactly. You just go and make so, yourself a cup of tea, Asher. Yeah? Sure, this could be a while. We, we went down into lockdown on the 8th of July. We were made, the lockdown was made stricter on the 2nd of August. They released a roadmap on the 7th of September that was basically going to get us out of lockdown in a really functional way at the end of November. Now, everyone in Melbourne right now is counting the minutes towards the press conference that Dan Andrews is going to be holding on Sunday, where he is almost guaranteed to announce significant um, relaxation of restrictions because we cannot in this state make it to where the... So we can't physically get the numbers as low as they need to be for the plan, the roadmap that had been announced. But mentally, no one can do it. The state cannot do it. I don't think that the Premier could even do it if he wanted to as well. This role or this this um roadmap that was announced on the 7th of september was an absolute fantasy it was never going to happen uh, actually chris, chris at uh, the time okay chris i'm going to interrupt there because yeah. be, be, because i think it's actually important to say uh we picked this and you pick this because there is going to be a lot of spin around this and this is why it's important it's not just blowing our own trumpet um the spin is going to be uh, we had these numbers. They were good numbers. It was a good plan. What a shame! Well, then we ran the then we ran the supercomputer again. Yeah, and yeah. Oh, and and disappointingly, you know, some people let us down. You yeah, know, yeah. you know, we'll, we'll get chided by the headmaster again about disappointingly. Yeah. Uh, Somewhat. So I actually just want to run a brief clip. We don't do this very often on this podcast. A brief grab from you 
saying exactly what you said at the time. Uh, Josh, roll the tape. There is no country on the planet, as far as I am aware, that can achieve that threshold. This is not just a conservative approach to coronavirus. It is the most conservative in the world. And it is a, it, it, it's fantastical. It's, it's imaginary. It's, it's completely un, implausible. It's, it's, um, I, I, I find it hard to sort of overemphasize how unlikely it is that we will ever achieve the goals on this roadmap, yet they are the ones we are being told that we have to if we're going to do something as basic as having Christmas with our family. There you go. So, thanks, Scott. So now let me quote Daniel Andrews, the Premier of Victoria. It may be at a point where we have to call it, where we have to say this is as good as it will get. Then let me quote um, Brett Sutton. Oh, sorry, not, not quote, but anyway, uh, this is a headline from The Age. Roadmap being withdrawn because restrictions are causing harm, says Brett Sutton. The chief health officer says health authorities are reviewing the daily case thresholds because of the social harm caused by strict stay at home orders. Now, I don't know, but I think we knew this, Scott, <laughs> <laughs> how incredibly harmful and how incredibly um, easy or relaxed that so many of these policymakers were into going into this sort of lockdown. And we've been talking about the, the sort of mental health harm and the, um, the non-COVID related. The um, economic costs. Been, the economic, and the, the it's, it's, you know what? So just as a digression, I, I've, I've been thinking, and so we've been talking since the start of the crisis. I wrote a book about this, about the economic harm of this lockdown. But in Victoria right now, the economic harm is it's written in, right? And um, they've done that damage. I, I don't want that damage to continue and we've got to start the repair. But it's so much so that I, I just want to be able to see another human being outside my immediate family. I'm just desperate to do that. And I think most of Melbourne is in that situation as well, that we just we, we just need something. We, we absolutely need something. But I, I, I want to dwell on this, Scott, because we have to talk about how recklessly we went into this lockdown. I'm going to quote here Tony Blakely. He's the um, a top epidemiologist at the University of Melbourne, and he's the, one of the loudest voices over the last couple of months for the elimination strategy. He's, so, he's the know, go to. Well, he's the go to man for the aforementioned journalists. Dr. Blakely, tell yeah. us why we need this incredible lockdown. He is now. Now he's he's now um, reversed his course on this. So he's telling the media now that we're completely over lockdown socially and economically. Our young people in particular are having their lives seriously impacted. Life is dull. The economy is hurting. We need to start living with the virus. I, I completely agree with him. Completely agree with him. But when he was writing about the case for elimination in, I think this is in July, I'm going to quote him here. For example, when we get down to 10 cases per day, rather than clamoring for opening up, Victorians should ex be excitedly saying, we are getting close. Let's keep going and lock down and knock it on the head. What this tells me is that there was a distinct lack of awareness about the cost of lockdown, not just to the economy, but to the moral psyche of the state. I've been saying for months that we are underestimating the cost of lockdown. It spirals across the economy, the society. I, 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 I think about, you know, all these people who have lost their jobs. What do you do when you lose your job in a normal time? You go to the pub with your mate and you complain. And you whinge. And that's, that's how you cope. We can't do that. If you've lost your job, you have been legally unable to use your basic coping mechanisms. You can't even hug your parents if you know, or you can't. You can't. Couldn't, you can't leave, see your couldn't, children couldn't leave. Couldn't leave your house for more than an hour a day. Uh, all this sort of stuff. Just, just the cost of those sorts of non-material things has been extraordinary, and the decision to go into lockdown without recognizing it is malpractice on behalf of everybody who made it. 
So, Asher, this really goes uh, to... That's my rant for the day. Uh, but, you know, tomorrow I'll be angry again. No, no. I, 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 sorry, just to, just to jump in. I, I mentioned this in the start. So we've been doing this podcast for about two years, right, Scott? Something like that. Um, and uh, when I prepare for the podcast and I, I do my little notes and I get the little quotes together and all that, um, uh, it, it, that's a sort of like it's an intellectual task. But over the last couple of weeks, as I've been preparing this content, I've been just struggling to cope with the emotions mm. that it brings up when I'm mm. reading these quotes from Brett Sutton telling us that, wow, it turns out the lockdowns are quite harmful. Who knew? Like, <laughs> it's, it, yeah. it, it, anyway. Yeah. Yeah. anyway, I'm, I'm out. No, so. no, no, it, <laughs> it is. No, no, quite, quite, quite right, Chris. This is not, uh, um, uh, economists have feelings too. <laughs> One might observe. <laughs> um, yeah, entrepreneurs have feelings. Yes, Asher. So this goes to the issues um, out, outlined in, in your paper on, which is called uh, Medical Capacity and Alternative to Lockdowns, which we'll be uh, linking to in the show notes. You can find it on the ipa.org.au website. Received extensive media coverage uh, and you were interviewed on Sky. But perhaps just walk our listeners uh, through that, Asher. Yeah, happy to. Uh, just before I do, I want to just add one thing to what Chris said. Um, I think the, the best way to understand why public servants tackle problems differently to, say, the private sector, a business person, is that public servants um, are all about process. Their ultimate question is, was the process followed? It doesn't matter if the process has bad consequences. It doesn't matter if it's the right policy. Their job is to follow the process. So if the minister says, do this, they do that. Um, the private sector will go, well, what was the outcome? What was the output? Um, and often they don't care so much about the process. Now, I'm not saying either side's the private sector's got the ultimate model and the public sector's ultimately flawed, but it is why public servants can be so blind and uncaring about the consequences of their policy. They're simply sticking to their program, programming, I guess, and how they approach things. And it's in, in, in a crisis like this with such human consequences, it seems to be inhumane. And, um, that is something that needs to be kept a constant eye on, on by governments to make sure that they are in touch with the people they're supposed to be working on behalf of. Um, in terms of medical capacity, this is a paper that I wrote with uh, Dave Wild, and we wanted to come up with a way out of lockdown which wouldn't destroy the economy and wouldn't see the virus become devastating as it had been in the early days. Uh, we, we calculated that the cost of lockdown of an elimination strategy, which is exactly what Daniel Andrews is doing in Victoria, has been uh, $319 billion, which is a, a significant proportion of the federal budget, um, clocking up massive debt, huge economic ruin, and, of course, the social consequences we've talked about. Uh, we came up with a policy approach which would see us come out of lockdown rapidly, where we would divide the country into three parts based on their COVID-19 infection numbers, their daily infection numbers. Um, what we did at the beginning when we released the report, Victoria was in a category of its own. It was still higher than the New South Wales average. Uh, but since then, we've actually dropped to alongside New South Wales and below. And what we're seeing now is the government is too stubborn to adjust their policy to bring it into line with the other major states of the country. What we advocated for was that states like Tasmania and Western Australia, which are basically COVID free, uh, would return to normal life but be vigilant with proper contract tracing and border control. States like Queensland, New South Wales would open their borders to each other, allow uh, agricultural workers to cross the border, certainly along the Gold Coast, but have uh, kids return to school, people return to work, and a few strict requirements in regards to, say, things like public transport where you are in close contact with people. Uh, maybe masks were required there just to limit potential spread. And then Victoria, which would be in that third category, uh, would ease up. People would be able to return to work in key industries. Uh, kids would return to school. Um, but the elderly would still remain under a form of lockdown. So if you're over 70, you would be still in uh, stay-at-home restrictions. And that is because the, all the evidence points to that they are uh, almost 100 times more likely to die of COVID-19 than someone under 40. And we thought that was a reasonable exchange of freedom versus uh, restricted freedom so that the rest of the economy could return to normal, people could return to their daily lives and we could also maintain that protection for the vulnerable, whether they're in aged care facilities or uh, at home. 
Um, it's interesting that within a few weeks of that, the Labor government's adopted, uh, sort of is not adopted, but gravitated towards that approach as the lockdowns have, are starting to lose serious credibility with mainstream Australians. Um, even though numbers are rising globally, fatalities are not returning to what they were at the previous peaks, uh, which says that lockdowns have sort of served their purpose. We've been bought that time to manage the healthcare implications, to get our ICU up to fighting strength, to understand things like steroid use and intubation and how they interact with the virus. So now it's actually time to get back to normal life. It is. And uh, I mean, the when I think about your paper versus Great Barrington, I'm, very, I'm always very aware that uh, our context is different to the sort of countries that they have in mind. Um, uh, in fact, it's another thing about the media coverage in Australia, you know, the, the level of hysteria over numbers that are, you know, literally, literally a hundredth or a thousandth of what we've seen um, in Europe. So the, the context is very dif different. And, you know, the, um, if you're thinking about, you know, England, France, USA, you're talking about the virus in the, in the community and essentially how they managed it. Whereas in Australia, obviously a much lower level and your paper's about a way of managing essentially around that lower level not in bands of zero to five cases a day, which is what the lunatics in Victoria were talking about, but um, certainly a band which is still low and managing that band through all the active measures you're talking about. But I think what is common is this idea, uh, the, the Great Barrington Declaration calls it focus protection, which is reversing the, uh, the incredible stupidity of, of having a, a program where because of concern for those who are vulnerable and this is like because medically they're vulnerable uh, because uh, it hits the, uh, the older population harder, those who are vulnerable immune systems, because they're vulnerable, we're going to lock down an entire country. Yeah. And so it's about returning the focus towards protecting the vulnerable and allowing those at much, much lower risk to enter into the workforce um, for children to go to school school for god's sake you know the the when with a virus it just like it didn't have to be like this but it just so happens that all of the studies show um that uh, I, th I think at one stage one of the papers quoted uh was you know there's basically been no uh no one die from any transmission of coronavirus at school in those states of the u.s where kids have been at school but uh, here we are, we've locked down for months and months and months with tremendous harm. So it's about returning to that focus. And, and we have to because one of the things driving this is fear. Um, I was talking to a member of the IPA, who I'm sure is, is listening, that when uh, it's been hyped so hard that we have uh, older members of our community, many of them are sadly just terrified um, you know, they, they hear, oh, well, my chances of dying are 100 times greater. I am terrified. I support locking down the country as the way to protect me from that risk. We have to be able to say to them, no, we can, we can protect you and we can do it through a means other than lockdown. This, this is actually a critical transition point, I think, Asher. Yeah, I, I agree. And look, I think the way to think of it is like this. At the beginning... The IFR rate, the fatality rate of the virus in March was 3.4. Uh, the flu has traditionally been 0.1. So we thought we were dealing with, you know, end of days type scenario where millions would die. Um, what it is today is 0.65. So it's fallen away considerably. The large number of those people in the 0.65 are, are in that higher risk category or people with preconditions. The reason it was 3.4 at the beginning was because uh, in Italy, it was like the worst of all situations. It was a country with a terrible healthcare system, horrible uh, hygiene controls in hospitals. Uh, they had direct flights to Wuhan. They had an elderly population. They had terrible pollution from across the border. So people had health conditions with their lungs. And, you know, Italians would often kiss hello. So this perfect storm of conditions all sort of came together for everybody to get it a lot of older people to die from it and we thought that was normal and so the entire lockdown and response was based on the assumption that that would be the same in every community and as we moved through uh, march and april we they got into aged care centers and you know how we responded there we took the people who had coronavirus and aged care they were sent to hospital 
The hospital said, no, go back to the aged care facility. So we put the infectious amongst the vulnerable and then we killed and globally killed thousands because of that policy decision. Mm. And that's what kept the numbers up then. But we don't make those mistakes anymore. We don't do intubation, which has also led to high fatality. We know what steroids do in terms of controlling the immune response on people, which also led to high fatalities previously when we didn't understand it. So now that we've learned all these things, the death rate has dropped considerably, but the policy response hasn't adapted. Mm. And I think that's where Daniel Andrews has made the big mistake. He's still treating it like it was in March and April. And we are now in October leading into November. And it's a different world. Um, those people over 70 need to be protected. Those in aged care need to be protected. Those with immuno disorders or preconditions need to be protected. But I think we need to keep in mind that there's an economy here. There's children that have uh, serious consequences of being in lockdown. I'm a father of four. I can see the change. I can see the change in my, myself, my wife, our exercise, our parents, our kids. Uh, they have serious consequences that don't seem to have been factored into the lockdown assessment at the beginning. But there's ne it's never too late to right or wrong. And it's never too late to change position based on new evidence. That's what good leadership is about. And I think that's missing in Victoria. But, you know, in a positive way, it was what happened in New South Wales. They changed tact and then they got the benefits from it. Completely agree, Asha. Um, uh, and in that sense, isn't, won't it be interesting to see what Daniel Andrews says on Sunday? The most important press conference of his political career. Yes. I suspect. Well, for, as, for as long as that continues, uh, we shall see. <laughs> for as long as that continues, we shall oh, see. Oh, so, so can I, I should put my prediction out um, uh, just for the record then. So my prediction Brave. about Daniel Andrews. Yep. So um, uh, he has to make some... Um, so for politically... For political reasons, quite apart from health and economic ones, he has to reduce some restrictions. But what he's going to do is um, reduce some restrictions. He's going to ride out the rest of the crisis, say in January or or December, when he can say, you know, I've got I've got a Victoria on an even keel. We're dealing with contact tracing. Da 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 da. da. Then he resigns. Then he retires. Um, he retires then as a Labor hero. All the Dan stands will still love him. Um, and he'll retire then because he doesn't want to spend the next two years, because it'll still be um, uh, uh, the better part of two years until the next election. He doesn't want to spend that time relitigating quarantine inquiries. He doesn't want to spend that time relitigating contact tracing problems, all that sort of thing. He'll retire as a hero for the Labor Party, at least. Um, and, uh, and, and then we'll get a new period. That's my prediction. Scott, hold it's me quite, to quite a reasonable prediction. And um, hopefully it will take... Brett Sutton with It you. is. I'm trying to do reasonable predictions because if you recall, and we're going to really hold him to this, Gideon Rosner thinks that Donald Trump is going to take 40 states uh, <laughs> and made that prediction on the podcast and uh, we'll have him straight on after. And so I... Let's see how And to touch on um, uh, some themes that we've talked about on this podcast and, and that I've talked about in my columns, uh, whoever that replacement is, if it's Jacinta Allen or uh, Martin Foley or whoever, this is your chance not just to be a Premier but to rebuild the institutions that Dan Andrews has destroyed. We, When we say dictator Dan, uh, you often get this response, oh, how can he be a dictator? There are elections. The point about what Dan Andrews has done along this way is destroyed all of the institutions in Victoria that could have actually given us a better outcome. Asher correctly said... Um, public servants care about process. All these processes have broken down, destroyed by Dan Andrews, um, didn't want cabinet government. Um, uh, he's had kitchen cabinets and he's had these so-called uh, missions and all these things which have destroyed the accountability of government. The ALP in Victoria is under suspension. They use the Adam Somurek uh, setup and uh, so-called scandal as the excuse to suspend the operations of the ALP. Um, uh, they've they've uh, absolutely restricted the ability of Parliament to sit and hold ministers to account. Uh, they've tried to nobble the Legislative Council. They're operating under a state of emergency, state of disaster. Um, so that's like you had a rant, Chris. That's that's mine. I just uh, I invite the next Premier of Victoria, who will be a Labor Premier, to take that opportunity not just to. Uh, enjoy the trappings of perhaps a slightly better white car and a slightly higher salary, but to actually rebuild the institutions 
Um, go back to the labour tradition of someone like John Cain, who was a builder of accountability institutions uh, in this state and actually restore uh, what the reputation that the Labor Party once had, even as recently as Steve Brax and John Brumby, for delivering a pretty good government uh, within the framework of the ALP. That's the opportunity that awaits the next Labor Premier of Victoria. We have come to that part of the show where we talk about our, our books and culture picks what we've been reading, watching and listening to. Before I throw to you, Chris, I might just remind yeah. listeners that this is a, um, a program brought to you by the Institute of Public Affairs. If you're not already a member, please do join or donate so that we can commission works like that ter uh, terrific uh, research paper from Asher Judah and Daniel Wilde providing an, a path out of lockdown, uh, which, again, Jacinta, if you're listening, there you go. Um, nice bit of reading for you. Um, Chris, what have you been up to? Uh, so I have uh, watched um, the first part of a Reason magazine series on uh, what they call the high-tech Hayekians. Um, the title of the series is Before the Web, the 1980s dream of a free and borderless virtual world. It's about a 10-minute uh, documentary so far. I think this is the first of four parts that's been released. This is a little bit of my day job um, because it's about the early cypherpunks that eventually um, developed uh, cryptocurrencies and developed, eventually developed the sort of radical opportunities of blockchain that that um, uh, that I do for my actual job. Um, uh, it, it's a very, very fun series. It's particularly fun for me because I know personally a number of the uh, people being interviewed on it. But what it does reveal i think or it does remind us or bring about it, there, there's always been a tension between the freedom movement on the east coast and the west coast of the united states so on the east coast it's been this environment of think tanks of public policy on the west coast though in silicon valley in california it's always been uh, about getting out of the state so not um, focusing on legislation, but focusing on building ways to make us more free. Now, I'm really excited by that. One of the books that, that I've published this year, um, The New Technologies of Freedom, is about precisely how we can use these new technologies um, to, to build more freedom, to capture some of our freedoms back without asking the state for permission. But this is a really wonderful introduction to the origins of that sort of thinking in a group of computer scientists who discovered Hayek and a group of economists who discovered computer science and the incredible opportunities that that presents for um, individual liberty. It's a sort of even you, Scott. Even you, Scott, could get into it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's, uh, well, I, we needed um, uh, in this uh, dystopia that we seem to be sliding into. It's always nice to see sort of optimistic views of the capacity of technology <laughs> to make our our lives better. A touching faith yeah. in the capacity of technology to make our lives better is always welcome. Um, I might I might go next, and uh, we'll let our, our special guest uh, Asher uh, take us out. Um, not surprisingly, um, my favourite book at the moment, Chris, is this one: um, "Climate Change: The Facts, oh, 2020." Have you read the, it? the fourth in the series, and uh, I had the uh, pleasure of reading it um, in various proof versions, and uh, uh, actually working with Jennifer Marahasi um, uh, to the extent that I could. Um, uh, to shape shape the book, and uh, and I've learnt more about the many many wonderful authors. Uh, um, uh, some of them are hardcore physicists, um, like Richard Linson and um, and Peter Ridd. Um, and it takes a bit of patience for laymen, but it's uh, to get through some of their stuff. But it is written for the layman, and you you can certainly do that. Um, uh, and then there are other chapters which are more from a, a public policy perspective or uh, wonderful people like Joe Nova, who is a science communicator of the highest order, um, who pulls apart uh, the so-called proof that you get from ice cores that you know um, CO2 is driving uh, catastrophic global warming. And uh, she points out the limitations of ice core data. So there's things like that. Um, and the other reason why it's a good book, Chris, is I'm in it. Um, <laughs> and and I might just uh, uh, just uh, as a teaser just talk about a chapter that I, I got to co-author with um, uh, Dr. Paul McFadgen, who is a uh, who's been a scientist, also a public servant. Is this, is this because I got to quote myself on this podcast? You're going to quote yourself? A absolutely. Um, it is. Um, 
It's about uh, research grants, Chris, a subject dear to your heart, and all the problems that you have with research grants in an environment where um, uh, governments are responding to media hype and climate catastrophism, so they finish up through their grant awarding processes, uh, awarding grants, um, in this case, to projects just because they've pressed the climate change button. And, uh, and just as a teaser, so we do talk about projects that are actually just complete rubbish, um, where you can get hundreds of thousands of dollars for, for talking rubbish about climate change. Um, but then I actually felt sorry for the real scientists buried in the ARC grants, and, and Bella de Brera, um, who's now become uh, very au fait with how these research grants are distributed and uh, has been having another look as well at the Australia Council. She pulled out these poor little biologists who have... The only way they can get a grant nowadays is to talk about um, bloody climate change. So if you want to study the southern hairy-nosed wombat, you have to talk about, and this comes from the grant applications, predators and climate change threaten Australia's arid zone wildlife. If you want to study blind beetles, you have to say climate change is having dr drastic effects on animal biology, threatening many species. Recent data suggests that changes in body shape is one such effect. If you want to study frogs in rainforest, rainforests, you have to you have to say to get the grant that oh, and they're especially susceptible to climate change. Um, there was a project to predict the effect of future climate change on the koala populations. Uh, emus, uh, uh, you know, as it see above. Um, someone else wanted to know why are fish shrinking as the climate warms? Um, I'm not sure what evidence they had that fish were shrinking. Um, or what, yeah, this, this, is, this is a sort of a nanity that you get to. So anyway... Um, so we have a wonderful, I think it's a wonderful chapter because I'm one of the three authors. Um, and then we say, look, the ARC process is such rubbish, you might as well just throw it out and start again. Um, I'd rather just, I'd actually just rather write a check to the universities, Chris, and let them deal with it. At least then they'd be... Just write a check to me. Just send yeah, me your money directly. You, you can be the vice chancellor's delegate on how it's handed sure. out because yeah. the conclusion we reach, Chris, is when it comes to these sort of grants, you couldn't do any worse. Look, look, Scott, I mean, feel free to do that, but just put my name on the check. Okay, I'll see what I can do. I'll see what I can do. Um, so that climate change, the facts available, uh, you can get in through our website, ipa.org.au, or you can go straight to a special site that we've put up, not just to buy the book, uh, but to have allied information, such as some fact sheets that we're developing and some videos, uh, which is climatechangethefacts.org.au. Asher, what have you been reading, mate? Thanks, Scott. I've been reading uh, this book here. It's called The Storm Before the Calm. It's a book written by George Freeman, who is a geopolitical forecaster. Uh, George has written a couple of books, uh, one called The Next 100 Years, which you may have heard of, uh, where he predicts the next 80 years of this century uh, across the globe, uh, outlining which countries are rising, which ones are falling. Uh, one, a few of his predictions include that America will remain the sole superpower, uh, Russia will collapse, uh, China will not manifest, as people think, as a, as a superpower. And, um, you know, in this book in particular, he talks about the American empire as a country that never wanted to be an empire but effectively is. He talks about how it's gone from a settler society to um, become what it is, arguing that, you know, the, the, the Louisiana Purchase from Napoleon is basically what unlocked America's full potential and made it inevitable that it would conquer its continent. The, the central premise of his current book, his latest book, is that America changes in cycles. The last major cycle was in the 70s, which was the dog decade, where the, the decade before major change is always tumultuous. It's often violent. America looks more divided than ever. And then they elect a president where there is a great reformer, and that happened to be Ronald Reagan. Uh, the tension emerges because the reforms of the previous era have run their course and they are no longer working and the system is creaking. So Reagan came in, he changed the system, he changed finances, he freed up the tax system and then unleashed the next decade and a half which Clinton and others benefited from where America had a terrific uh, uh, period of prosperity. He argues now this decade that we're in and that a bit of last decade is uh, that tension emerging again and the 20s will be another tumultuous decade. Trump is perhaps a factor of that where we'll have great division uh, and in difficulty, but at the end of the decade, we'll 
will emerge with new reforms. And I think his central reform... And that, in and the- that great reformer is Joe Biden, to clarify. No, no, no. He, he's, <laughs> his, his argument is it doesn't matter who the president is. That oh, the okay, cycles sure. in America are beyond the presidency. Hmm. That they, they just force the hand of the leadership, as often foreign affairs does, and that their major reforms will be in immigration, where America will stop being a country which you know controls its borders to keep people out, but it will it'll actually transition to a nation where it will seek immigrants from around the world to manage its aging population and labor shortages. Uh, that will change its 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 the way it works. It, some states will benefit, some won't. But it's a fantastic read, and, and I'd certainly commend it to people in the IPA because it talks about the importance of geography and how that shapes the destinies of countries, uh, it, how the United Kingdom benefited from being an island and that allowed it to defend itself at a cheaper cost to, say, France. Uh, France needed an army and a navy. Uh, the British didn't need an army. It just simply needed a powerful navy because if no one could cross the strait, they wouldn't need an army to defend themselves. So it, it talks about America and how it's protected by two oceans, how it's got weak neighbours and some of the best geography on the planet. So I think it's a great read, eye-opener. It will certainly couple people's thinking on you know the benefits of economy and social policy and uh, systems of government and philosophy and how they all combine and how America seems to have got most of them right. But also happily it talks about why America is unlikely to fail because its system is ultimately the most flexible on the planet. And they will all enjoy every hardship it faces. No, it's a good read. It does, and it I commend it. Does sound really interesting. And even even that very first thing you said, I think, is important um, because we've heard all the uh, the hype, uh, often based on simple projections. Um, you know, China was growing at ten percent, therefore it will keep growing at ten percent, and will overtake the US by you know twenty thirty or twenty forty or twenty fifty, whatever the model is. But there is that alternative school in international relations that. The future can actually look very much like the past. That you know that you know incredibly transformative change. You know in the relative power between countries doesn't necessarily. Um, there's nothing inevitable about it. And uh, yes, uh, and as China sort of falters, um, you, you come back to the idea. Well, perhaps uh, America will never be the hyperpower it was. In, you know after the end of the Second World War, but it still could continue for a very long time roughly as it is in terms of global being the, the still the the most dominant uh, global player is that essentially what the book is saying it, it does talk about that it, it makes the interesting point that it happens to be located in the best place on the globe um, up until i think 1980 1990 uh, the majority of global trade went through the atlantic now it goes through the pacific and that's the first time in human history the pacific's been more important for global trade Well, America's located between both oceans. Uh, It's the only country that has ports on both sides and therefore its military can exercise power in both spheres, the Atlantic and the Pacific, at the cheapest cost. Um, Europe can't do that, can't impact in the Pacific. It has no ports, it has no countries there. China has no presence in the Atlantic. So its ability to influence and shape and pressure around the globe is considerably cheaper for the US than almost every country on the planet, and therefore it can exercise power much easier. Yeah, and well, so, that, sec- that, so, that, that's important, and it's not really discussed. It's just a matter of fact. No, it's good. Uh, I'll concede second best located country in the world, mate. We've got two oceans mm. too. Yeah, yeah, we do. And but Canada, you know what? Not, well, not as much trade in the Indian Ocean, unfortunately. Yeah, but, um, yeah we just need. We'll see what this century brings. Yeah, we need India to get, and Africa to get their act together, and then we, we're sitting pretty. This is the best country <laughs> in the world. Um, and um, so, but anyway, good luck to America as well. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, to our listeners, thank you for listening. You've been listening to Looking Forward, a product of the Institute of Public Affairs. I'd like to say a big thank you to my panellists today, uh, my co-host, Chris Berg. Thank you, Scott. Uh, hang in there, mate. Hang in there. We'll see what happens on yeah, Sunday. Yeah. No, we'll see what on Sunday. Can, can only get better. <laughs> and a uh, very special thank you to our special guest, Asher Judah. Thanks for having me. It's been great Pretty to have you on the here. show. Uh, thanks, as always, to uh, Josh in the control room. We'll be back with more Looking Forward next week.